Okay, thank you for returning for our last uh, session of the day. We hope you found things informative and, and enjoyable so far. Uh, we have an absolute rock star of soil science, Candy Thomas, joining us for our last ses session. So uh, uh, take it away, Connie. Uh, Candy, I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, so I was asked to give you guys a little bit of a background on some different types of practices that uh, folks can use on their farm in order to enhance uh, pollinator habitat. So I put together a pretty good group. At, um, NRCS has a lot of really interesting practices that do enhance quite a bit of pollinator habitat. So um, a lot of people say, well, I can't really implement those because it's costly. So um, I'm gonna also give you a little bit of information about um, how it can not be so costly. So um, part of our challenges, and, and this is one, uh, if you see me do soil health, this is probably a pretty standard photo um, that we have is um, population growth, of course, obviously is taking up a lot of, of that open land and even some of the urban land is being covered up in, in cement and we're losing some of that, that biodiversity because of this loss of ag soils. Um, also that changing climate. So as the climate is uh, slowly warming, um, this is kind of impacting the way uh, different pollinators react to their environment. And then also water quality and quantity, believe it or not, those are some big, uh, big side um, things that, that pollinators need in order to, to survive. So when we look at insect uh, decline challenges, it's not just that um, it's not just you know ag that's at the at the root of the cause of the of the pollinator decline. You can see that biological factors um, such as introduced species; those introduced species bring with them um, a host of problems such as uh, other diseases and and um, not being a good quality nectar source for some of our different insects. Uh, urbanization you can see is pretty high. Loss of, of native forests, rivers, and wetlands. Um, and then we've got a, a five, around 5% being uh, uh, geared towards global warming. But it's not just these. Um, to the extent when uh, I showed you on that previous, uh, this previous slide here, you can see that urban area right here. It's kind of changing. Um, this is a kind of an interactive group there, but you can see those urban areas are getting larger. Along with those urban areas comes a huge amount of light. And so that, that light pollution, artificial light um, at night negatively affects thousands of different species of beetles, moths, wasps, and other insects that have evolved using light cues for courtship, foraging, and navigation. So some ways to, you know, keep uh, light pollution from being an issue for sure is to shut your lights off outside. Um, another one is changing your bulbs uh, to an amber colored bulb or um, for sure taking out those white or blue light type of bulbs. Those cause them the most uh, issues. Using a motion sensor so that it'll turn on and off um, when you leave that area or cover the bulbs in some kind of a housing because this is a really big uh, negative impact for a lot of our insects and is causing them to not go through these courtship rituals, which increases the amount of, of, uh, of uh, insects in, in our area. So this, we're asking a lot more now, you know, in the times that are, are coming up for agriculture. Uh, generally, we look at these natural ecosystems and everybody always says, well, let's mimic, you know, native range. Well, let's mimic this and let's mimic that. So this is a conceptual framework that shows this comparing land use and the oh. trade-offs of these different yep. ecosystem services. Um, so these provisioning uh, arms of, the, of that uh, flower, it's called a flower diagram that you see there. Are, are different for different uh, land uses. So those uh, small ovals you can see um, for forest production, preserving habitats and all of those ecosystem services are pretty high ex with the exception of crop production. So as we try to um, get more from agriculture, we've totally obliterated those other, the other ones that we had in that natural ecosystem and now we're maximizing this crop production aspect of, of intensive cropland. Um, and, and there's a lot less biodiversity around the region. 
and you end up with these massive, huge areas of monocultures. And so uh, our goal then, of course, is to try to move to a more native landscape here. So when we try to add in more, you can see we can try to get more equal, equal footing with all of these different uh, ecosystem services. We try to manage cropland in a different way, that intensive managed cropland um, that has, you know, always produced a huge abundance of food at, at the fork, <coughs> excuse me, in the short term was doing this at the, uh, at the, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, please, at the cost of diminishing other ecosystem services. So if we can try to move in more pollinator type of habitats and improve those natural areas, not so that it's like that natural ecosystem, but kind of a simulated uh, natural system with restored services, um, that can give us a lot more benefits in the long run. So uh, what we wanna do is uh, try to look at this as a more of an agro ecosystem specifically. Sorry, I have to shut this timer off on my uh, slide set there. So uh, we want to try to look at an agro ecosystem in regards towards specifically towards pest management. So you can see here in the middle, we've got this agro ecosystem management and everything below that with these arrows going down indicates that we're going to get a decrease in natural enemies, species diversity, population increases and, and pest species. So when we do more conventional tillage, um, without regard to, you know, the soil ecosystem itself and try to remove every single weed and produce these monoculture crops. We do that at the, at the expense of this habitat diversification, organic soil management and low soil disturbance practices help increase that. So our goal is to try to improve this by adding back in these hedgerow, shelter belts, windbreaks, um, have polyculture type of, of cropping versus monocropping. Um, improve rotations instead of the corn, the corn bean conundrum, move into a system where you would have wheat and then add cover crops after that wheat, which would provide another uh, source of nectar and diversity. So what we want to do is try to do this plan diversity and plan diversity is what, what you plant and when, and also if you have livestock to the system. And our goal is the hope that this leads to this extra associated biodiversity where all the microbes, herbivores, carnivores, decomposers in the soil um, uh, will be improved. And that's directly tied to those management decisions that you make on your, on your farm. So low pest potentials occur in these types of systems, high crop diversity through mixing of crops and time and space. So we gotta have uh, more than just corn and beans. Um, Kansas is probably one of the only areas uh, that I have in my uh, group of uh, what, six states now that I cover that has probably the best diversity. Um, there, I counted up at one point and I think there's at least 12, 12 different crops that have potential to be cropped in the state of Kansas, which is pretty amazing compared to a lot of the other states, um, especially for looking for markets. Um, this continuity of monocultures and time through rotations um, try using shorter maturing varieties. Uh, a shorter maturing variety planted earlier in the year will allow you to have a larger window of opportunity to plant more pollinator type cover crops. Um, use crop free or preferred host free periods as well. Those are, those are important things that you can do to try to mimic these natural systems. Um, try to create this mosaic of these different smaller fields. Um, not taking out the hedgerows, that's how you do that. Um, those, those hedgerows, I know Kansas has quite a few of those CCC implemented hedgerows. Um, there's one, uh, one gentleman's farm that I, I like to go to to collect soil. It's one of the only places in, the, in our state here that has Valentine soil. Um, and he has one of those CCC uh, uh, windbreaks. And it's really quite beautiful and, and amazing to me in the fact that it's been there since the 30s. Um, it needs some work, it needs a little bit of fixing, but it did create this, uh, the scattered field type effect. Um, even in the, the monoculture cropping area where he's at, he's got this big magnificent hedgerow that's full of all these natural enemies that assists his crops on, the, on either side 
where that's adjacent to it. Um, farms with a dominant perennial crop component. So adding in perennials back into your systems, even if it's just for you know three to five years can uh, help with this biodiversity loss that we're dealing with. Um, high crops densities. So try to you know, increase your planting populations to reduce the amount of weed species availability. Um, any open spaces is habitat for weed, uh, but also be tolerable of some of these different weed species. Some of them have really um, high you know, provisioning capability, like uh, you, most people don't think of it, but field pennycress, um, henbit. A lot of our winter annuals provide quite a bit of, of uh, foraging uh, nectaries and areas like that in that early spring period before we really start getting a lot of different types of, of flowering plants. Um, I accidentally clicked on security, that pops up, there we go. Uh, high genetic diversity resulting from the use of mixtures or crop multi-lines. So putting in um, different types of corn varieties instead of having just one, you know, 4250 Pioneer brand or whatever it happens to be, uh, put in other, other different uh, multi-lines in with that. So you get some genetic diversity. Um, those also uh, have different plant root exudates that bring about different types of soil micro, microorganism populations. Those soil microorganism populations are the feeders of our higher level uh, pollinator species. <sighs> So well, now we're getting to some of the practices. So this one is pretty neat. Um, this is uh, uh, planting flowers. So not many people think about plant and cut flowers adjacent to their cornfields, but as you can see um, in this instance, this photo, I think this one was taken in uh, California. So they've got on your left-hand side, there's some corn and then they put some oats. You can see kind of that hazy grayish green adjacent to those cut flowers. They have uh, some vine or some uh, netting over top of those to keep uh, birds of prey from, from getting in there. Um, but they will take those flowers and they will cut them and then sell them. So it's another opportunity for, um, for income when you are just stuck you know, with, with corn or beans, it's, it's a different type of an opportunity. And sowing flowering crops instead of crops that do not offer any floral resources for pollinators can enhance wild pollinators in these real heterogeneous type of, of landscapes that we have of you know, just monoculture crops. Um, here's some more pictures of, of intercropping. I don't know if, if Robin Griffith is on here, but um, Steve Swaffer took this photo. So Robin um, and uh, Kelly Griffith a uh, really interesting story. Um, first time I came across them was in uh, Western Kansas, of all, or well, actually Burlington, Colorado of all places. I got to listen to them at the, at the Colorado Conservation Tillage Association talk about how they're adding in pollinators, beneficial pollinator species with their, their, uh, their crop there. So you see he's growing sunflowers, um, black oil sunflowers for oil production. And um, they've placed in, you can see one flower for sure in that mix there is, is buckwheat. And so when we zoom in closer, you can see he's got quite a mix of different types of seeds down in there. You can use buckwheats, so you can use some, some uh, clovers, but I know um, I, I don't have his mix with me, but, but I know Robin, if he's, if he's listening, he can let you know um, what he put in there. Uh, one interesting thing to note, I do remember him telling when uh, he was telling his story about how they did this um, was, you know, they didn't necessarily see huge increases in crop yields. But what interesting thing that stuck in my mind was the oil content, he said, increased. And so when you can get a premium for, you know, better oil content, um, that can be a win-win and help you pay for adding in some of these, these different species that help provide these ecosystem services to other crops. Here's another one. Um, this is on Lance Fikert down near Buckland, Kansas. So you can see um, what he has here is sorghum, sorghum uh, for grain. And then intermingled into that sorghum, you can again see some buckwheat. I'll move in a little tighter. You can see some buckwheat, they have guar in here. Um, some other different uh, phacelia, which didn't express itself all that well. I can't remember if there was flax in there or not, but those are some different pollinator type of species. And the reason why they were doing this was to target 
uh, sugarcane aphid. So they're trying to bring in green lace, lace wings and other um, uh, predatory type of insects to combat taking any loss from, from that aphid. Field borders. So field borders, another opportunity. This is a little tighter, uh, closer field border, but you can see um, they put some, again, this is another cut flower scenario. So adjacent to the, another corn crop, they put in sunflowers, which will be sold as cut flowers. So they'll go out and cut those flowers and then they, they take them to a, uh, a florist and sell them direct. Uh, one interesting thing about the field border, excuse me, is that those are the places where we generally tend to see our, our highest compacted soils, our lowest soil biodiversity, mainly because of the amount of traffic that they get. So the amount of um, uh, yield is usually generally fairly low in those areas. So why not put something there that you can turn on that could be a native, uh, a native warm season grass planting with a lot of different types of forbs, flowering forbs in it. Um, you can turn on it. You can also manage it. Um, some of the, I know if you're looking for something, you know, and you're using a lot of herbicides and you have atrazine in your system, there's switchgrass and, and eastern gamma grass are slightly tolerant from, from that herbicide. So you can kind of make this work in a way that you improve your biodiversity along the field edge. You're creating those mosaics, those field mosaics that improve biodiversity out in the field. Here you can see um, that cut flower. There is a bee on that. That uh, I zoomed in. I didn't notice it. And then I, when I zoomed in, I noticed. Oh, look! There's a not a. Uh, it's a native bee, not a, a uh, honeybee. Wind breaks. Uh, so this is the one thing that um, I I like the most, especially out in in rural areas, um, large scale. Uh, wind breaks. Um, you can really add a lot of diversity to a windbreak. You can have your coniferous type trees, you can have deciduous trees, you can have a shrub component as you can see along the bottom edge of this. So we got shrubs and then this guy went in here, this is Wayne Fredericks, he went in here and planted a huge pollinator mix right adjacent to that. Um, mainly just because he felt like he wasn't getting much yield right adjacent to that, but this extra bit of, of pollinator habitat there increased biodiversity. And when he's planting soybeans adjacent to that, like you see there, um, soybeans are, are um, pollinated by insects. And so that provides that little bit of an insectary for also for predatory um, insects. Everybody says windbreaks are terrible because uh, you lose yield. So this is a new study uh, from 2019. I've been waiting for this one to come out for a while um, from Charlie Barden, Ignacio Campiati, and um, I'm not sure who Osorio is in that group. Might've been a grad student, but they've been looking at um, yield monitors and windbreaks. So what they did was, um, found that directly on that leeward and even on the windward side of these windbreaks, uh, throughout the growing season, um, up to 5, 10, and 15, almost, what was it, 10, 11, 12 times the height of the, of the windbreak, they're seeing an increase in yield. So you can see when that first probably, you know, 10, 15 feet of that, of that windbreak, where you see, says one, two, and three, they're having some, you know, crop deficiencies, crop losses. That's where you can put in something like what Wayne did. He put in grass with pollinators in it. Um, but then on that leeward side throughout the summer, especially here in Kansas, the wind is obvious all summer long. Um, and when that's a high uh, evapotranspiration loss. And so when we're, you know, our plants are transpiring and we're getting a lot of wind and it's sucking the water out of them, that equates to losing yield essentially. So we don't want any of that uh, high evapotranspiration loss. So having those there is a, a great benefit. Here's another graph just to show you the benefits of windbreaks because I like them. I was a horticulture major, so uh, trees, um, I, I love trees. And so here's looking at this, um, a mean proportion of parasitized stink bug egg masses over two years in a tomato field. So you can see those green stripes are where the tomatoes are um, with and without hedgerows. And they compared that showing that when they have the hedgerow there, they've got increased amount of egg masses um, to take 
uh, some of those ecosystem services away from the uh, spraying of the crop and instead turning it to more natural type of control. Here we've got more hedgerow benefits. I told you I was going to give you hedgerow benefits and here they are. <laughs> Number of individuals, as you can see, um, the total uh, parasitoids increased dramatically with the hedgerows compared to our total pests, which have decreased with the hedgerows compared to the weedy field borders. So all of those provide you with, you know, natural, natural spray opportunity, non-spray opportunities. Um, all of this works if, like uh, you heard our speaker this morning, I believe his name was Dan, when he talked about the neonicotinoids, as long as we start considering what we're putting out there, then we start seeing this, this more increased biodiversity. So it's gotta be a holistic type of management. Um, this is something that Iowa State started to promote. Um, I know uh, in North, Northeast Missouri, when I was working in Northwest Missouri back in the early 90s, there was a young man by the name of Peter, Peter Lohs. Uh, I believe he was from uh, Denmark or Sweden. And he came over and he was interested in replacing all of our terraces with these stiff, stiff stem grasses. So he had this idea, this concept in mind for controlling erosion, the same thing that Iowa State did. Iowa State pushed it a little bit further than Peter did, uh, but you can see what you end up with is really breaking up um, that, that, uh, that monoculture cropping and, and creating a huge mosaic. Um, you can see the goals there, they say are to reduce soil erosion, improve water quality. Um, these started specifically in that raccoon watershed area, trying to reduce the amount of nitrogen runoff. So they used a lot of warm season grass plants in there and for flowering forbs. And they also looked at getting additional pollinator wildlife habitat. So you can see up to 25% of the track, um, this is their CRP um, opportunities in Iowa now. Um, that up to 25% of the track can be enrolled. The minimum width is 30 feet and the maximum width is 120 feet. So this meets our contour buffer strip criteria in a lot of states. Um, and you don't have to put it in CRP. You can go in and if you want the assistance, because uh, you know these flowering forbs are not cheap. I put in 10 acres and it cost me $4,000. Uh, it wasn't, it, it was not very, uh, you know, I didn't get much cost share for that. Let's just put it that way. So it was a huge expense. So having some assistance through like EQIP or even um, the Conservation Stewardship Program also has opportunities for putting in these type of practices. But you can see, you can put them along or through a field. You can even use these um, as a area along the edge as a field border. You can put them on the contour. Um, these grasses, if you use native grasses, they're rather stiff stem. They can replace a lot of terraces. Um, they say put them in uh, your terrace channels. Um, if you have really poor aggregate stability though and your upland is you know eroding, you put this in a terrace channel, it's going to drown out. So you got to be cognizant of the fact that you might need to find some species that can handle being in water. Um, and there are some native species like Virginia wildlife <clears throat> that does pretty good along water courses and there's a lot of flowering forbs that, that can survive there as well. So this crop impact to these biodiverse flowering strips can be pretty, pretty good here. So you can see, um, let me see if I can get my mouse to go over here again. Over here, we've got blueberries that were planted. So a high, a real high value crop. They put in this, uh, this nice pollinator strip that's adjacent to these blueberries. And so these smaller fields can increase this land heterogeneity and also benefit pollinators because the species that uh, forage for these flower nectars, as you see in B here, can only go about a, a one kilometer or more from their, for their nests. They don't travel really, really far. Um, so these plantings of wildflower species uh, that they selected for the support of pollinators enhanced the blueberry yield, as you can see here. Uh, they had a planting in midsummer with the blueberries in that upper right hand corner. And then uh, there in B, you can see is that close up of those mature uh, plants ab after they, they got to mature a little bit. And then when you look at that graphic there, that percent change in yield is in blue. So initially you can see they had a negative cost associated with planting these 
these uh, pollinator species. Like I said, sometimes the seed is not cheap. So um, finding, you know, some really uh, ways of getting some cost share can be really helpful. But you can see over time um, that started to go in the opposite direction and they started to increase their profit and they had a percent change in yield increase as well. So that gold line is that cumulative profit and it shows that initial cost of establishment in the first year was paid for finally by that fourth year. So it can pay for itself over time if you have the time and the wherewithal to wait for it. Also <clears throat> enhancing these pollinator strips can enhance crop yield through wild pollinators. So, you know, we talked a lot about today about um, native bee or um, honeybees uh, so the cycle of wild pollinators decline in a lot of our ag systems. Um, and that's mostly, mainly a lot of the native bees um, need some type of a stiff stem. The solitary bees like to be in um, stems that are hollow. And then we have ground nesting bumblebees. And so they don't like disturbance and they've got to have some type of habitat. And as we increase this ag area, as you can see with this yellow here, our natural areas within the landscape have decreased. And that in turn then has started to decrease the amount of, of, of our pollinator abundance. So it's turned out that a lot of the, the way we can improve our ecosystem then is by bringing in, of course, these uh, non-native bees that produce honey, which is another ag, ag sector. Uh, so this pollination limitation hinders the yield of pollinated dependent crops, and it decreases that temporal stability of those, those crops, and also promoting compensatory land conversion to ag at the expense of these natural areas has caused another big dip in the amount of, of wildlife, wild pollinator uh, species that we're losing. So by <clears throat> putting in these pollinator strips, you can see that uh, we can start to increase the different types of bees because we'll have the habitat and just honeybees on their own do not increase yield as much as when we start getting different types of species richness and species abundance. Then we can see that that crop yield starts to become exponentially larger over time. So these prairie strips um, or contour buffer strips, whatever you want to call them, they, they can be eligible for CRP in many states. Um, and that, like I said, was a program that kind of started at Iowa State with Lisa Schulte Moore. Um, and she's done a, a super job expanding them across the state of Iowa. Um, they can, but like I said, they can also be implemented in the EQIP program. And as you saw from that blueberry uh, scenario, that they, if, if you're in a high value cropping system, they can increase that fruit crop production by 54% just by having these pollinator insectaries adjacent to these high value crops. The other one that, um, that I talked about in uh, early on was managing for a perennial crop from uh, managing a break from regular crop with a perennial break. So, um, you could seed down cropland for three years to 10 years. It just depends on, um, you know, a land ownership specifically. If you own the land, it's a lot easier to seed something down than it is if you're renting the land. But even in a short term, um, if you can pencil out small areas uh, to, you know, just put in clover, um, that even in an organic system is a super green manure crop. Um, if you need to turn it under, it's better to turn, um, you know, green under than brown down, I always say. Don't turn brown down, turn green under, use a green manure. Um, so utilize that, that pollinator habitat in year three as a, as a high biomass uh, nitrogen source. Um, but native plants are best for the long term. I, I totally agree with, with the um, NRCS and, and my counterpart here who took these photos, Stan Bolts, he's a range con in the state of South Dakota. Um, each and every soil in our state is tied to an ecological site description. Those ecological site descriptions you can get from your local field office. Um, they can tell you the ecological sites that are on your farm and those ecological sites are tied to a historic plant community that was based on native vegetation. So there's a shrub component, a grass component and a forb component. All three of those are super 
um, pollinator habitat. Try to find what those are within your, your local ecoregion and get those established because natives are the best. Um, not only that, um, not only do they, uh, they enhance the pollinator habitat, there's also this thing called, what they call morphic resonance. Bruce Tania, um, he uh, has this, uh, well, his wife wrote this book, Farming with Nature, and, and they talk about in there this morphic resonance where um, these native, these native uh, grass plants, of course, evolved with the soil microbes, and those soil microbes are native to where they, where they you know, became. So whatever plants evolved there, there was a microbe that enhanced that plant. Um, and that microbe also was enhanced by the plant from those root exudates. So any of those organic acids, the amino acids, the polyphenols, the tannins, all of those, all of those uh, root exudates, those compounds helped feed and provide this habitat for the soil biology. Though that soil biology didn't leave. When we went out and say tore this prairie up and, and farmed it all, it's still there. Most of it just ended up having to become uh, a cyst or, or become a, uh, a spore of some sort, and they're just waiting. Once those root exudates in South Dakota State did an actual study on this, um, come back into the, the system, those, those uh, microbes have, have a tendency to come back as well. So the impact of in soil biodiversity and perennial versus crop. So when we do put these perennials in, you can see this is adjacent to cropland. Um, the the uh, perennial is the black field dots. And this, we're looking at root biomass here specifically. You can see that soil biodiversity has increased with these perennial uh, prairie remnants. This is actually from uh, Kansas. This is, uh, let's see, it's Coleman et al. And it was done in 2010. It's the long-term impacts of high input annual cropping and unfertilized perennial grass production on soil properties and below ground food webs in Kansas, believe it or not, I found this. Um, so they looked at the bacterial and nitrogen fiction communities specifically in croplands and grasslands, and they found that they were pretty significantly different when they, when they compared these two. They found that nematode community indices suggested enhanced fungal decomposition pathways. So they had a lot more fungal feeding type of uh, nematodes versus root feeding nematodes, which is a good thing because that's a, a hierarchy which allows for a nutrient um, release. So here you can see the bacteriovores, the fungivores, the omnivores and predators. These are all nematodes. And you can see the abundance of these these uh, these um, these bacteriovores in the cropland was was pretty low compared to in the grassland. All the values were higher in the grassland compared to this cropland. And you ask how old was this cropland? So some of this crop was well over 75 years in crop. Had over uh, had a was uh, also had a, an abundance of nutrients applied to it. Uh, unfortunately, the perennial that they're comparing here, they call it grassland, is actually hayland. So when you look at this and you think about hayland and we're looking about the amount of total nitrogen that's available in the soil profile, because they also did this looking at the soil organic carbon, the organic matter. Um, that ROC is that, um, I call that that bubble, bubble gum juicy carbon. That's that first juice release of those, um, those exudates that the soil organisms use as a, as a food source right away. So soil organic matter provides many of the mineral nutrients that's essential for crop growth. We all know that, right? Even in intensively fertilized grain crops, it provides about 50% of the crop's nitrogen needs. So that, I mean, and now we're trying to put on two times that to make up for the 50% that we can't get. So that takes out some of that organic nitrogen use that we were getting before we started adding in these, these extra nutrients. And about 50% of that uh, soil organic matter is carbon, which provides a chief source of energy for soil microbes and vertebrates. And then those higher, higher level invertebrates that feed on them in that soil uh, food web. So we're talking about, you know, beetles, um, beetle larvae, springtails, all of those little critters that you can see running across the surface. Um, all of those are utilizing that as a food source. And removal of uh, Newman Turner um, back in 1950, he was a good friend of, of Sir uh, Albert Howard. They were like best friends. And Sir Albert Howard was like, why don't you, you know, get some land and start looking at some of this on your own? So he had a dairy 
and he found that that uh, removal of native pasture or rangeland results in a reduction of around 1,400 pounds of nitrogen from the soil, more than what is ever required or recovered in that crop over a 20 year period. If you think about that, that's, that's a significant amount of nitrogen that the crop is never recovering, uh, mainly just because of the, the that is in uh, uh, organic nitrogen versus that readily soluble nitrogen. So the difference there can be pretty astounding. And so you can see here, in our graph that we got 3.1 in this grassland, which is hayland, so it's being mined, uh, versus a 2.2 in the cropland. So they said, despite the fact that um, in this study that the annual crop fields have received approximately 70 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year for the past several decades, relative to the, the harvested perennial fields, that the levels of organic carbon have been reduced by 28% and a total amount of N by about the same amount in that upper 60 inches of soil. So we're starting to lose a lot of this when we, when we move, you know, and we can start gaining some of this back as we move to a perennial type system compared to our crop system. So adding back perennials does more than just, you know, allow you to uh, feed pollinators. It can also feed your pocketbook. And how does that work? Um, for people specifically that are farming. So this is Wayne Fredericks. I had one of his photos earlier. Um, underneath our conservationwebinars.net, we had a webinar with Wayne and he is one of the most interesting people I've ever, you know, they talk about the world's most interesting men. He's one of those. Uh, so Wayne has been capturing his uh, on-farm data for over 20 years. He's been keeping track of yields, inputs, everything, rainfall, you name it, 20 years worth of data. And so he was looking at this field here on the left. So you can see uh, those red areas on this yield monitor are the areas where he's got low yield. And so he turned in all of his uh, data to this, this gentleman by the name of Huth, and he went through and he looked at it. And so he said, from what we've seen, between 3 and 15% of most of his fields, so he's got more than this one, is consistently not profitable. So year after year, he's adding the same amount of seed corn, the same amount of spray, the same amount of inputs as the rest of the field. In some cases, even more because the yield is lower. So he's trying to increase yield. So how do you increase yield? You increase your inputs, right? So he was putting even more on there. So this guy suggested that his fields be put on a strict input diet because their productivity is never gonna achieve the yield that he's been trying to get there. So what Wayne decided to do in that area there specifically was to seed it down. So he went and he seeded that down. You can kind of see there's a yellow cast out there. Um, those are his pollinator habitat that he put in. Um, from this, he's seen water quality improve. He said farmability has improved, especially because he squared off that corner of that field up there. Um, he's also increased profitability because he's no longer throwing money away out into that field where he wasn't uh, gaining any yield. And so that helped pay for this seed. So you can see here's some more water quality and he's got a herbicide buffer now um, for that stream channel there for his crop there over clear on the right hand side. Here's again, his, his windbreak. He increased his profitability and farmability again, because I told you how uh, that leeward side, 15 times the height of that, that, that uh, windbreak here, 15 times that height out in here is where he's seeing his increased crops, crop yields because of that windbreak. And he's increased his farmability, squaring off fields instead of having these little odd areas he's always farming. Here you can see another little odd area has predominantly full of, uh, I think the time that he took this, it was full of like Maximilian type of sunflower or another sunflower earlier in the year. Here's another uh, thought that he had. So he's got this uh, really compacted area of just, it was just bare dirt adjacent to his, his, his sheds. And so he thought, well, why not just seed that down too? So he put a bunch of the pollinator habitat there. He said, I can drive on it. It doesn't hurt it. I don't drive on it every day. He said, I'm only driving on it once, you know, or twice a year when I take the equipment in and out of that shed. And he goes, it's, uh, it's, it's just improved the look of things around his, his property. And it's 
created an easy place for access. No more mud. Um, another thing, especially out here, bonus, snow fence. I mean, we've got a place that's keeping, you know, that snow from blowing over into uh, your field roads or your road to your house. Um, that it can also collect snow and keep it and store it for water storage later on in the, in the following year. Um, this is his wife. Uh, they say they've got people coming now to their house just to visit their pollinator strips instead of them. Um, and it's, he said, is one of their sources of, of really personal pride and enjoyment. Uh, here's a smaller scale. So we've got Minor Morgan in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So he's got a high intensity cropping, uh, vegetable cropping system uh, near Albuquerque. And he has planted uh, cover crops. As you can see, we've got a close mown. This is after of some uh, clovers and some cereal rye adjacent to his crops. Then we also have, you can see some more, there's more cover crop. He's got good mulch cover. So we really didn't talk about uh, needs for a lot of our beetle larvae. Uh, mulch is, is one of those things, you know, and especially with wolf spiders um, that are natural predators, um, those also need good cover. So having good residue on the soil surface is another benefit as well. Also, it's a benefit for soil health, obviously. Um, here you can see that uh, plant diversity, he's got a lot of different type of crops growing adjacent to each other. You can see that cover crop before it was mowed with some of the clovers in it. Um, this is all drip irrigated, by the way. You're probably wondering how he's got all this crazy stuff growing in the desert. Um, it's drip irrigated. Then he lay, lays down a mat of uh, uh, a mesh mat, and then he plants his crop into that after he uh, tills up his uh, cover crop in that area there. So he, he's got a green manure crop. He's putting in uh, some nutrient, um, nutrients. He's putting in a nitrogen clover base in there. Pollinators in his system are very important. There you can see he's got, I believe that's a peach tree there on the left, and he's got uh, a non-native flowering species here, but uh, Russian sage is a, a good flowering pollinator mid midsummer. Um, has a nice color, and it's, uh, you know, a, a real good benefit, especially in this system. Here you can see he's utilizing as an IPM strategy, not just for uh, the sake of uh, having insect pollinators, but for nematodes, he's using the marigolds as part of his IPM plan. There you can see he's got uh, that strip prepared to put another crash crop in that row there. So insect requirements. So what do they need? They need a season long bloom at least. Uh, they need a succession of blooming flowers on the farm that throughout the growing season that can provide a continuous source of nectar. If not, they have to travel long distances that, that's expensive in the way of, of uh, uh, energy expansion that, that they can't afford. Where possible, have native plants in the mix. Um, there's substantive evidence that native plants support more pollinators than non-native. So be sure to look for your native plants. Um, even more research shows that native plants improve our buscular mycorrhizae fungal association that's dependent upon the number of times, and, and they've showed a correlation between that native plant and the AMF increase uh, from pollinator visitation. Select flowers by thinking of feeding, the feeding habitats of your different types of pollinators. I mean, we, here we've been talking specifically about honeybees, but wasps and flies have a very short feeding capability. They have a little short, uh, short um, siphon that they have to get flowers. So don't get just get flowers with really deep reservoirs. Try to get some um, that have a wide open panicle like a yari or showy golden rod, something like that, that they can get to easily. Avoid planting annual crops. They attract more pests than predators. Um, so, you know, yeah, you're going to get your bachelor's buttons and these types of things and even marigolds. They're nice annuals. But in a lot of instances, they bring in things that, that you don't want in your system, especially if you're growing fruits and vegetables. And shelter. This consists, I showed you earlier on, on, um, on uh, Morgan's farm there, he had that cover, uh, undisturbed areas. The ground beetles need it. Um, if at all possible, when you're putting in your pollinator strips, you know, those large strips out in the field, um, if you need to do some type of field work uh, and you have a plow, plow up a berm along either side of it. That may not allow the water to get into it, but that berm, even maybe down the middle of it, if you allow the water to come through partway, is a really good place to put stiff stem grasses and create a beetle bank. 
of native warm season grass. Um, it's where they, they live over winter, it's where they breed, and those carabid beetles are omnivores. Part of the year they're, they're eating weed seeds, another part of the year they're annihilating all of the, uh, of the grubs and other things that are out there in your, your cropland that you don't want. Management, control weeds during establishment especially. Um, for perennial cover, be sure to control weeds by either mowing and spraying or both. Um, remove all invasive species to comply with state, you know, your state weed lists as well as being a good neighbor. The thistles are good habitat for pollinators, but bad plants for neighbor relationships if left go to seed. So be aware of that. Some of them are, are a lot of our native thistles are, are really good and um, are very beneficial. If using fire, be sure not to burn entire areas. Instead, split them up into thirds and allow areas that are undisturbed for ground nesting bees as well as providing new growth for nectar in the second year and habitat for nesting in that third year. So uh, have a good plan. Make sure you have plenty of humidity at the ground level to minimize soil damage because we don't want to damage our soil fauna as well um, from burn intensity. So you want to make sure that your burn is not intense, that it has a short duration, it goes through quickly, and that it uh, does not uh, get into contact with the soil. Use of grazing animals can help habitat uh, change really dramatically. The landscape of flowering plants um, changes over time to time. I know uh, on our place, we've changed the the uh, brome field to um, more forbs and other different types of grasses. It took us a lot of time, but real intensive adaptive grazing, strip grazing, um, high density stocking, um, increase the biodiversity. And so it, you can do it over time if you have the time. Otherwise, uh, the only way is by spraying. <laughs> spray. And if you're going to spray with insectaries in mind, if you're adjacent to habitat, turn off your spray booms. Um, look for pesticides that have a lower efficacy to insects that are beneficial. Um, there's a, every label has something on it about bees. Um, so read your labels and be sure that what you're spraying is, is not uh, inhibitory to beads. Get off the tractor and spot spray if all else, uh, when all else fails. Um, you, you know, you have two legs, you were made to walk. You only got one butt, it wasn't made to sit. So get up and do something. Dig up your problem plants, place them back down over that disturbed area so that you got good soil cover. We don't wanna leave the soil uncovered or naked uh, and susceptible to erosion and then also uh, thermal heating. Um, that will then also provide cover to reduce uh, other weed germination. So programs for insects. Uh, I have uh, given um, Ryan a handout, which is pretty cool. So this is one of the programs that we have. It's uh, NRCS targeted monarch effort. And looky, Lou, Kansas is in this. Uh, so I put the Kansas handout in, in, your, in your information. I think it's under the documents. I have no idea where it is. It got in there somewhere. But this link, uh, I made this hyperlink so that you could click on it. Um, this is a, a really neat program. The document that I gave you, Working Lands for Monarchs, has the most fantastic flower color chart in it, um, all native, uh, shows you the color types because different types of pollinators prefer different colors of flowers. If you sat through the bee, uh, the bee basics earlier, um, she talked to some about uh, different types of flowers and whatnot. So that's pretty important. Um, there's also a section in there, you can see that bloom period, they got early, late, and mid, so you can time it. Um, and you can pick out your your uh, monarch value, um, which is high, which can also be pretty beneficial for our bees as well. Um, here's the conservation security program. There's a ton of bundles, just targeted specifically towards pollinators. You can see those there. Um, there's even more. I didn't put them all on here. <laughs> there's so many um, bees and pollinators and uh, monarchs and dung beetles. You can see I even added the dung beetles in there because I, I love the dung beetles. Eliminate the use of chemical treatments to control pests and increase the presence of dung beetles. So we're talking about, um, you know, pouring on uh, for your cattle. You start eliminating that, try to improve dung beetle habitat. Uh, there's all kinds of assistance. Uh, this can help so offset that cost of, of that, these expensive native plants. Uh, resources available. 
This Picture Insect is the, one of the coolest apps uh, I've kind of fell in love with. I haven't gone premium yet, as you can see, but I think I should. Uh, you take a picture, so we've got this as assassin bug over here, or the stink bug. You can take a picture of that bug, and it will tell you what it is, which is pretty cool. And if you really like the photo you can take, you can make it into a wallpaper, which is kind of neat. Share it on Instagram. Um, there's that. But I mostly use it to ID a lot of different types of insects, which is neat. Um, habitat planning for beneficial insects. There's guidelines in here for biological control. So if you're looking for natural control, very good book. Um, Managing insects on your farm. One of the best free books. This one's free as well, free for download. On Xerxes, sorry. Um, this is uh, written by Miguel Altieri. Um, he's kind of a hero of mine. Um, these ecological strategies in here, I shared with you some of them. Um, you, He's, he's pretty phenomenal, uh, especially in man managing for, for agroecology. And then we got farming with native beneficial insects. Both of these have a lot of color plates in them of different insects and uh, pests and predators both. And whatever predator um, they also, or whatever pests they show, they generally give you the name of the, of the predator that can help solve that issue. So these are just some of those uh, free Free resources, all these here I show you are free unless you want these bound up, you know, and tactile, then you'll have to pay for them. But um, Sarah and Xerxes, uh, you can get those and download those for free, as well as that picture insect. So uh, soil health principles. Uh, we've got to integrate these four principles in, in order to improve uh, biodiversity and increase pollinators. Uh, there's just no way around it, you know, having continuous living roots that are flowering and maximizing that biodiversity in the landscape, you know, changing up the different types of crops that we have out there, having cover so that we can have places for these beetle larvae to hide and spiders to live um, and minimizing the disturbance uh, so that we have good places are for this, these insects is, is extremely important. So this all goes hand in hand. Uh, as you can see, um, there is that um, one, two, three. Okay. And so if you have any questions, um, and if we can't get through them here, there's my email. And then there's also my phone number. Um, and if you want it, if I stop sharing to move to the question so I can see Ryan, um, you can get it off of the recording. Okay. All right. I was just typing those out in the chat quick. So um, oh, thanks. Hopefully, hopefully I got your phone number right. Um, you did. You did. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Candy. That's excellent. Tons of great information. I did a pretty poor job um, introducing you at the beginning. No, that's in, okay. <laughs> in case anybody uh, is in doubt yet, Candy works for the National Resources Conservation Service, part of the yep. USDA. So yep. um, if you didn't pick that up, there you go. So um, yeah, you can tell from my slide set, it's all yeah. over it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, a couple questions um, about some of these uh, pollinator strips and, and plants. Uh, would cattle enjoy foraging uh, on these options? Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, we put in that 10 acre pollinator habitat on our place. And uh, we, had to, we had to put some pretty intensive fence around it because <laughs> uh, we don't have the best fence on our property. A lot of it is, uh, you know, questionable, uh, but it is hot where we do have it. And we had to, that was one place we had to put two lines of hot wire up because uh, they kept wanting to get into it. Um, so uh, what we put in there was um, a lot of uh, cool season native species. So um, I got those from... Uh, up in uh, uh, Broken Bow, I can't remember the name of that seed company there, but Broken Bow has a really good, besides Sharp Brothers and, and the ones we have here, this, because I was in Iowa, I used Broken Bow. Um, that's where our farm's located. And uh, the seed seed was really good. And they do tend to get a few of them um, that can be uh, poisonous plants. But if you work with one of these local guys, you know, like at Sharps or at Broken Bow, um, I can't remember that kid's name that helped me out there. Um, we chose non-toxic plants. So, um, and if you ever listen to Doug Peterson, he'll tell you there isn't a toxic plant. It's, it has to do with longevity, duration, intensity, and, 
in, in the grazing. Um, so uh, yeah, they can help you find those plants that are non-toxic, but most of them generally they'll, they'll work through, you know, if, if they want to eat them, they'll eat them. They may strip off a few leaves. They may take off flower heads specifically because they're high in protein. Um, other than that, you know, they haven't bothered them too much unless we leave them there for a long period of time in a small space. So you just gotta manage it. Thanks, so. um, Do you have any thoughts on the benefit of adding organic matter with microbes to crop fields to help jumpstart soil improvement? Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's sure. That's a, that's a beneficial, uh, aspect to any system, you know, um, increasing organic matter allows you to improve planting habitat. So you'll get better establishment, obviously. Um, so, you know, composts, um, even biochar charged compost, uh, with sure. compost, any of those things uh, help, can help improve, uh, soil habitat. Um, especially in Kansas, where we got a lot of really low organic matter, you know, anything can help. Um, I spoke with, you know, David uh, Johnson quite a bit, uh, ate with him and his wife um, some and uh, got to be pretty good friends with his wife. And she she actually knows even more than he does <laughs> when you think about, about compost, believe it or not. Uh, but uh, they both said that uh, once we get above about 3% organic matter, you know, their, their Johnson Sioux bioreactor, he said, is, it's, it's not even really necessary, but, but it, it can be utilized as, as, a, as a, a seed charge as well. So yeah, our, our organic matter is pretty low. So anything you can do to help it. Compost is, is wonderful, so. Yearly compost, and I mean, if you read Newman Turner's book, that's pretty much how he, uh, so he eliminated all uh, commercial fertilizer on his, his land and he said from the elimination of that, he was able to pay for one person to make and, and apply compost, the yeah. savings and inputs, and like didn't have a change in you. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, I might ask Linda if she wants to expand on her question, but she asked about contour buffer and prairie strips. Um, are they planted on berms? They don't have to be, no. Uh -uh. I, on, uh, generally, I know in NRCS, we've always said that if you're over about, you know, five, five to eight percent slope, you want to for sure put them on a contour, um, you know, around the edge of the field, kind of like the natural so that allows for that, they call it row grade. So as you're planting around that hill, allows the water to follow those rows. And then if you see down your low as part of this contoured buffer strip system to a waterway, it can filter and run that water if it's not going in, obviously. I mean, if you have poor aggregate stability, it's gonna run down the hill to the strip, run along the strip and then run down and out. Um, so. Uh, I would put them for sure on the contour, or if you got a nice, great, straight, flat field, you can just put them in strips, you know. Um, I think it was Lucinda today wrote me and she's like, geez, how, how far apart should these strips be? Um, and so I got to doing some digging and some looking, you know, because really there's, there's it's kind of open. Nobody really knows how far apart these strips are supposed to be for maximum pet, you know, pest benefit. Um, but they have stated that, you know, 15 feet is super great. I mean, because they're pretty close. Because you think about the size of a beetle, if you saw a bug's life, and you saw that beetle flying, uh, they can't go very far. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a big trip across the entire field to get to some place where they're going to find somebody to eat. They'll stay along the perimeter if, if there's no way for them to travel. Uh, so that'd be the very minimum 15 feet apart. But um, they suggest between 120 and 155 uh, feet apart is, is doable. And you can still get some good insect movement across those and have a place for them to land and, and to, you know, to be. But you got to really pay attention to, to like what Dan, was it Dan this morning that talked about the neonics? You've really got to pay attention to what you're spraying out there because, I mean, uh, we're like he said, we're negatively impacting um, you know the soil there, uh, so that we're not getting um, the full benefit. Eco, you know, the ecosystem services that we should be getting 
from a lot of these these beetles and other larvae that, that feed on pests. They'll amplify that, even worms. Um, somebody asked what soil biology this morning. Um, earthworms are, are highly negatively impacted by, by, uh, by uh, fipronil, which is one of, the, one of the pesticides you talked about. Thank you. Um, I had a comment that the flowers are in the pollinator mixes are really beautiful. Can you explain a little more how they add to Kansas farmers' traditional crop yields, um, or does it just mainly improve soil health? Well, both really. I mean, it depends on what types of crops that you're planting. So, um, in the case of uh, you know, we saw, and I talked about using some of those uh, different lines of of seed. Um, I, I was with Mark Jansen early on in, I think it was 2013 or four, maybe it's 2015. We went to the, that was the year that they had the sugarcane aphid issue um, here in Kansas. It was huge. Uh, we went to the, the sorghum field day at K-State and went up there and was looking at all of their plots. And what was interesting to me, you know, is um, we've, we've been tinkering with seed for a lot of years in order to try to achieve yield. Um, every single one of those varieties that had been tinkered with um, was infested with sugar cane aphid. Those that did not have um, those issues were real old varieties, uh, specifically from Africa. So this, these older seed varieties, which are really hard to get, <clears throat> you know, can help provide an offset some of that risk. In the interim, we've got to provide something to offset that risk. So this intercropping, you know, putting those pollinators within the, in the rows, adjacent to the rows, uh, can be really beneficial during those high infestation years. And that can help offset yield. Uh, in the case of soybeans, that's our other, other uh, pollinated, uh, insect pollinated plant in the cropping systems. It can provide quite a bit more research in Europe and uh, I think Australia on the benefits of, of pollinators in yield than there is in the United States because we've always been about killing bugs, not enhancing bugs. So uh, that work has, has really shown quite a bit over there. Um, other than that, when you look at corn itself, uh, having pollinators can be beneficial in the way of the side benefits um, of removing those neonics. So a lot of the reasons why we put those uh, neonicotinoids out there was because of, of uh, the problem we have with uh, cutworms. So that cutworm and the rootworms all were are, are damaging our crops. So if we have these predatory beetles, um, and Jonathan Lundgren has spoken about them at length. I mean, every time you guys have had him, uh, he's spoken about those uh, carabid beetles. Um, when we use that fipronil out there in those fields or those neonics, uh, we are destroying those, those uh, carabid beetles. They're a voracious predator. Um, and if we can remove one, uh, one of those input costs just by enhancing you know, the diversity out in our field and improving habitat for these carabid beetles by either using no, or for sure using no-till, but also um, reducing that insecticide and then providing the habitat with these beetle berms adjacent to these pollinator strips. I mean, I, I think we're gonna start seeing all kinds of improvement. I mean, cause it's not just above ground, the diversity above ground enhances the diversity below ground. That below ground diversity then in turn, you know, changes into yield because they're the ones that are mineralizing all the nutrients in the soil profile so that your row crop plants can have, have that benefit of organic nutrients versus inorganic uh, soluble nutrients, which are costly. Yeah, thank you. Um, Chuck had a question. Can we burn existing brome patches and then drill in or seed, overseed uh, with more desirable plants? Oh, I hate brome. <laughs> brome is as horrid as, as fescue. And I came from the land of fescue in Missouri when I worked there. Um, Ugh. Well, brome is kind of, uh, brome and fescue both um, have their own affinity for their own type of fungi, believe it or not. And it's not our muscular mycorrhizae. So the endophyte that was is within fescue is, is rather inhibitory. 
and brome has a compound that it leaks out that that resists the the uh, the you know the association with arbuscular mycorrhizae. So getting rid of it, it's a good thing, right? One of the only ways I know of getting rid of brome is our recipe that uh, for mass destruction is what we called it in Missouri. The recipe for mass destruction of those sites is to yes burn in the fall while it's green. So not really fall, more like summer, August, early August, we go out and burn. It was green, you would be bawling. It's just, I mean, just your face is running because the smoke is so intense, um, but that damages that plant excessively. So once it starts to come back with some green regrowth, it took about two, about at least a quart of Roundup in the fall, then you let it come back again in the spring, let it come back up, because it will, and then you're gonna have to hit it again and drill right into it. The best way to do it is, is to try to drill uh, warm seasons in the, in the fall. They do the best in that November period, during that dormant period, um, and you get the best kind of uh, enhancement, especially for our flowers usually need a cold period or a chilling period to break dormancy. So, um, you know, having that overwintering period then just enhances that. So you end up with more flowers. Uh, but then after that, then you got to really be careful with your, you know, mowing afterwards after, after you've established or drilled in your, your warm season grasses. Mowing doesn't hurt flowers and it doesn't hurt warm season grass during that establishment period. Some people think that it does, but no, I mean, if you can get a good stand in there, uh, you know, get good drill, not too deep. That's another problem. A lot of people drill it too deep. Um, you, you can have some pretty good success with that, but you got to have the maintenance as part of it. So you got to go back out. And then after year three, you get some good, uh, you know, you might have some good weed growth and you might have some good warm season grass growth and forbs that burn a third of it at a time to, to get rid of some more of that weed uh, seed that's there. Some of it can get high enough, can cook those weed seeds, but it also enhances the warm season grass to fill in those, those bare areas. Awesome. Um, we are running out of questions here and Candy is a great resource. So what else do we have? Anybody? Feel free to unmute yourself or chat. If not, if you just want to write, that's fine too. Yep, you can just email me. That's good. Well, I appreciate you inviting me to uh, speak at your your pollinator deal. Like I was telling you earlier, the rest of them to get to hear. Uh, I generally work below ground. <laughs> I do a lot. I'm an agronomist by trade, but I do a lot outside uh, with uh, producers under the ground, looking at uh, you know soil health specifically. So. Uh, it's kind of nice to come above the ground every once in a while and see what's happening. Um, Amy popped in a question asking for your top two highlights to merge agriculture and pollinator promotion, I guess. Say that again? Uh, top two highlights to merge agriculture and pollinators. So I guess... Um, oh, polyculture, you know, multi-cropping. Multi I think that's probably the best way we can, you know, high, large, large scale... Uh, agriculture needs to be polycultured. So we're, you know, different types of crops that, that can grow together and be harvested together and separated out or even intercropping, um, you know, planting uh, wheat into, uh, I said that wrong, planting soybeans into wheat, um, you know, before you harvest the wheat, all of those things, you know, it keeps the ground covered. It keeps the, keeps the, uh, the weeds from, um, you know, coming up as much. And then it also enhances biodiversity because we got more than one root actually date out there that improves, you know, below ground biodiversity as well. And, um, you know, and also uh, planting those strips. I still believe every single one of our crop fields needs to have a perimeter border around it. And it needs to be native warm season grasses and forbs. I don't care what people say. That's what I say. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, it's taken away from our, it's taken away from our, uh, and hedgerows. We need those on the south uh, sides of of all of our fields, you know, for sure. Um, if you own the field, put in a hedgerow. It doesn't. Those hedgerows are native, and they have so much biodiversity in them. And put some flowering plums in there, some native dogwoods. I mean, 
and then that strip of of uh, of the warm season grass with the flowers. And you 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 saw K State showed you you can enhance yield, but it's not going to take away from it if you do that. I think I've observed an uptick around here of more hedgerows being torn out, and, and mm -hmm. uh, definitely in the last yeah. maybe five years or so. What yeah. uh, what are you seeing when you travel around and? Yeah, I'm, sure. I'm seeing the same thing. And I mean, if you think about the amount of dollars that it costs to take that out to gain, what, a tenth of an acre, and they're spending over two to three hundred dollars an hour for a guy to go out there and push out a, a 20 to 30 year old hedgerow or, feel, uh, you know, uh, windbreak, whatever you want to call it, out. I mean, did you really make back that money? How many years did you make back that money? How many years did you yield just from uh, what did I say? Ten. It was like ten feet. The or was it eight feet? The height of the of the uh, the highest tree in your windbreak. That's not very far out. Put a few grasses out there. You got a nice turn row. Make your field easier to farm because you got a, a turn row. All your rows would be straight. Mm -hmm. You know. And I've seen a lot. Like you said, just piles and piles of trees. I mean, if if nothing else, if you think you've got to take it out, don't just put it in a pile turn it into biochar, make it into something that's usable. That's the other thing. I, I just hate seeing those piles being burnt up and, and you know, not utilized in a, in a positive manner. There's always a use. I guess I grew up with, with people, uh, my parents were from the 30s. We use everything. <laughs> so, you know, you reuse your tin foil even. So try to reuse your, what, you gotta do something negative, make it, make it positive. <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, um, have you seen data or know anything of pollen, nest, pollinators nesting in old, old hay bales laying around? Um, I had one time heard about predatory wasps nesting in old stacks of hay back in the day when they stacked it. And so I was just curious if you'd ever heard of. I've got I've a heard lot of that, but I've not seen around. anything. Um, that's a that's a good question. I'll have to look that one up. I'll get back with you, Jackie, because I got your email still, I think. Um, if I find something, I'll send it to you. Um, I do know that they they'll they'll get in old bales uh, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, old bee, the old barns, a lot of the old barns people tear down. Those are full of those carpenter bees as well. So, I mean, there's yeah. a lot of habitat that we're losing from that. But yeah, old hay, interesting. I'll, I'll do some digging, I'll let you know. Okay, I'm, thanks. I'm still working mm -hmm. on the Johnson grass issue plowing, oh, no. but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's one of those things that's pretty pretty persistent. You got your uh, work cut out for you there, above ground and below ground, that's a stinker, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, Lucinda just asked to clarify, did you say hedgerows should be on the south sides of fields? Uh, yeah, that hedgerows for sure on the south sides for that uh, southern wind as you got your crop planted out there. So you're getting less transpiration because as those winds are drying and hot and coming from the south and you got your crop planted out here, it's going up and above. And that's that protective where it said look, that leeward side, that's that protected zone that's reducing the amount of transpiration there. That's wind force transpiration. All plants tr transpire throughout the year, but there's wind force transpiration when, you know, that's blowing so much that those stomates uh, start to lose, or the plant in the ground starts to lose water. So then they'll put more water, pump more water out of the ground up into the plant to keep that plant hydrated. Then more of that gets blown back out of it. So we start losing water. Uh, then you start losing yield essentially. You know, it takes 22 inches of rain to get a, a 200 bushel crop of corn. Um, do we always get 22 inches of rain? No. So you got to have some water storage. Um, having, having that protected zone then, then increases that. And better infiltration in your soils. Yeah. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that I can share with you that study from uh, K State, which was kind of interesting. I know. I think Mark Jansen is on here, but I don't know if he's on here, um, but he was helping out with that, with Charlie Barden when that started and they were trying to collect yield data from people who had hedgerows versus people who didn't have hedgerows. And that's what they did was compared those, um, which was pretty interesting, you know, um, finally got it done. So they've been working on it for four or five years, you know, trying to find people to share that data and they did. And um, so what they found was 
was what I was hoping they would find, that it's a benefit, not a detriment, like most people say. Most people say, oh, those trees, they suck, literally. <laughs> They're sucking up my yield, you know, and they do within a certain, you know, along that drip line, most definitely. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Candy. Um, I've been dropping links in here for a shared folder that had um, some documents Candy wanted to share that were a little too big for us to upload. Um, yeah. So you can catch those um, really good. But those are those neat monarch things. Those mm -hmm. are really, that's a uh, one of the best. Every once in a while, NRCS puts out one of those really neat free things. And that's one of them besides, you know, the conquest of the land and through 7,000 other thing. But the, that monarch document, if you can get it, download it. If you can't go to just Google uh, the monarch program for Kansas and you'll find, um, you're part of the Great Plains, Southern Great Plains. You're in that section, Kansas is. Uh, Iowa and Missouri's in the Midwest. Nebraska and anybody North is in the Northern Great Plains. We're the cutoff from North and South. Mm -hmm. And they have one of those guides for each of those areas with pollinating plants, timing and color. I believe Xerxes helped us. And I, uh, I dropped, I think, links for both NRCS and Xerxes earlier in the chat as well, if you want to check them out, so. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan, for inviting me. Thank you. Fun. Thanks, everybody, for attending.